Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Barroso. My pleasure. Please tell me, how do you see the Congress today? We are talking right after the manifesto and we are looking at the European Union, we, who is at a crossroad. Looking to the, to the uh, war, looking to how it is reshaped and looking towards these elections on the 9th of June. How do you see it? So first of all, let me say that it's indeed a great pleasure for me to be here in the EPP Congress in Bucharest. Uh, it was, as you said, during my mandate, my second mandate, that uh, Romania joined the European Union, and I'm so happy that that was possible and that now Romania is such an important member of the European Union. And maybe I can start with that. It shows how important the enlargement is. So we have to think that the European Union will not stay with the current membership it will have more members. Of course, we have the aspiration to have Ukraine, to have Moldova, but also the Western Balkans. It's extremely important for those countries, but also for those who are already in the European Union. We need to expand this area of stability and peace that is the European Union. So that will be, I think, my first priority is to be attentive to the geopolitical challenges that the European Union is facing. After this war, terrible war launched by Putin's Russia against Ukraine. So we need to be geopolitical minded. We need to protect our union and the countries that will join our union. Another priority, of course, is the economy. If we do not succeed in the economy, then we'll have more extremism in Europe people that will explore the resentment. I believe there we should do more. For instance, completing the internal market, there is still a lot of fragmentation in the internal market. We need to be more competitive. There are others around the world that are doing better than us in terms of competitiveness. For instance, in technology, with artificial intelligence and others, we have to be in the front line of the progress in science and technology. And unfortunately, I don't see Europe strong enough in these areas in terms of integrated uh, policy. Uh, I think these are probably the most important priorities, the geopolitical concerns to continue to address them, but also the economy from the point of view of our competitiveness. I would add that, of course, the European Union should continue to lead on the green transition, at the same time it should do it with the respect for the social concerns of people, not put too much costs on those who are more vulnerable. If we do that, we'll turn part of our population against the green agenda, and that will be a mistake. And also, we should pursue our commitments in terms of the green transition, but without putting our industry and our agriculture in a situation of competitive disadvantage towards other parts of the world. I'm looking now at this manifesto and about uh, the project that Ursula von der Leyen is having for her new future, very possible mandate. And she's talking about a commissioner for expansion. She's uh, talking about a commissioner for foreign policy. And she's talking about a commissioner for defense. How are they and how did Europe reshape after your mandate and now in this context? I agree that uh, we should give more importance and, if necessary, uh, portfolios in the European Commission structure for these priorities. I just said it. Uh, at the same time, we already have a high representative in the Commission, high representative for foreign and security policy. And of course, the competences of that uh, position, it's a treaty-based competence, it's in the treaty, should be respected. But I believe it is possible, respecting the treaty, for instance, if that is the intention to have someone in the Commission that uh, follows more directly the issue of uh, uh, military uh, industry. So, industry for military purposes. We need it now in this very difficult situation. So, yes, I support all the ideas that make it possible in full respect of the treaties 
for the Commission to be active on everything that has to do with supporting a more geopolitical Europe, including on the fields of defense. At the same time, we need to build a stronger European pillar on defense that, of course, respects the commitments of NATO. NATO is there. Uh, it will be a complete mistake to think about replacing it. As we see now, more countries are joining NATO. That was a direct um, consequence of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So we are now having Finland and Sweden, former neutral powers now joining NATO. We need to have a strong NATO, but inside NATO we need to have a strong European Union pillar for defense, a strong European security and defense identity. How do you think that Europe will stay united and follow the policies that everybody should agree upon? Because we see Hungary, what Hungary did when voted for uh, the budget for Ukraine. We see what Austria is uh, acting now towards Romania on integration and Bulgaria on integration on Schengen. And these, these are questions on the unity on, yes. of Europe. I have some experience of dealing with these issues and it's true that that's a very important challenge. But I really believe with all respect for some countries that are still or the governments of some countries that are creating some difficulties that at the end they will not be able to block the European Union if there is a strong majority, a consensus on that direction. I really believe that. So, yes, for instance, there were some objections of the Hungarian government against some support to Ukraine and membership of Ukraine to the, Europe uh, to, to the European Union, I mean the candidature of Ukraine, but at the end it was approved. So, um, we need a strong Europe now. We need a stronger Europe, and we can only be strong if we are united. So, I will not support those who are, for very narrow points of view, are putting obstacles either against Ukraine or against the case of the current members, uh, Romania or Bulgaria. I believe that Romania and Bulgaria are entitled to have the full membership of Schengen. Please, one last question. With your experience, tell me, what is your message for the leaders of the EPP and for the leaders of the European Commission now? My message is simple. Stay united, stay firm. The stronger um, our unity, the better we can defend our interests and our values. This is an existential challenge. We are living a historic period of great uncertainty and great danger for Europe. So my first message is stay united. Of course, between 27 countries, it's difficult to all the countries to agree on all points. But that's why the European Union is the art of negotiation, the art of compromise. We there is something we don't like, but we accept because also on other matters, the others don't like our proposal. So this culture of compromise, stay united with that spirit. The second point is, of course, listen to the people. I was, as you said, in the Commission, for ten, leading the Commission for 10 years, but I was also in many meetings of the Council and the European Council. And I know that sometimes in Brussels, people lose the contact with the reality. One thing is the European Parliament, that's a very important institution, but another thing is what our people, our citizens, our men and women back home think. So it's important that there is not a bubble in Brussels, that the European Union institutions express what our citizens all over Europe, and it's a very big European Union we have now, what they feel, what are their priorities. So let's stay in contact with our people. And that's, I think, a very good message for the European People's Party. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and uh, I really appreciate uh, your presence here at uh, the Euronews studio at the Congress. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very much.